great to be with you. It's good to see familiar faces and to just hear about what God is doing among you. Excited for Salford. That's just so fantastic. But it's good to be among you, not least because it's great just to be together with God's people singing God's praises, isn't it? There's something about singing the praises of God with his people in his presence. And that's particularly special to me this year because, and please don't judge me, but I've, I've not been to Sunday gatherings this year. Ooh, you're looking a bit suspect about me, but suspicious about me. No, there's a rip. Because I've stepped, I'm not going along on a Sunday morning because I'm going to be going back to the church there just to give Dan space, you know, to settle in and bed in without me. You know, being around. And, and then I got poorly just after handing it over. I was sick for nearly about two months with flu and chest infection, things like that. And so frustrated to travel around to different churches, I didn't go on a Sunday morning for weeks and weeks. And when I finally did, I was determined I was going to be there on Easter Sunday and to sing, Thine Be the Glory. And because uh, I just wanted to sing with God's people. And I went to uh, one of the local churches in Huddersfield. I arrived late because I got the wrong time. But I arrived just in time for us to sing, Thine be the glory, risen, conquering sun, together on Easter Sunday. And it did my soul good. I was at a church in Halifax recently. And um, we were just, it was just wonderful. The word was great. The preach was great. But just singing with God's people. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, and I was struggling with my breathing at the time, but with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. And so when Richard invited me to come and speak, I, I prayed and I thought, and God said to speak to them about singing. Speak to them about singing and song. You see, my job this morning is to do what people like Paul and Silas and Judah did in the book of Acts as they traveled around churches. Not that I'm comparing myself to those apostles and prophets. But it was just to strengthen and encourage the churches. That's all I'm here to do. I want to strengthen and encourage you. And I, my mind went to the psalm, Psalm 118, verse 14, where the psalmist says to God, You are my strength and my song. You have become my salvation. There's something about singing that strengthens our soul. Now, there may be some of you there who are thinking, really, is, is that it, Trevor? Really? I mean, if you knew the things that I'm facing and struggling with, if you knew the trouble I'm in, there's a song right there, actually, if you knew the trouble I'm in, or don't you realize the global problems that we're facing in a world today, and, and you just want to talk about singing? Is that the best that you can do? Well, I don't know, but I'm going to because he is our strength and our song. He becomes our salvation. The way in which we anticipate and draw in his salvation, the way we strengthen ourselves as we await for him to move is through singing. Do you know the whole of creation happened to a song? The morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy as God laid the foundations of the earth. God himself sings. He surrounds us with songs of deliverance. Zephaniah tells us that he delights in us and rejoices over us with what? Singing. Singing. And even if you're not convinced yet, and I think you are, in fact, judging from what we've done this morning, I think I'm preaching to the converted. I think I'm literally, literally preaching to the choir. You know, you believe in the power of singing, but actually I'm just bringing back to you something that I received here, or at least if I didn't receive it, it was certainly encouraged in me here. About five years ago, I think I was at a, at a, um, a pioneer. I, I say I think I was at. I did know I was here. I, I, I mean, <laughs> I think it was a pioneer conference, a leadership conference. And I can't remember everything that was said, but one of the things, the, the, the theme song of our couple of days together was an old hymn. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And you might know the refrain of that in that hymn is, This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. And God said something to me, did something in me, placed something in me, or encouraged something in me through that. I went that, that Sunday all about this is my story. 
This is my song. I want to encourage you to let your story become your song. Let your story, the story of God's grace in your life, even in those hard times, even in those difficult moments when you're sowing in tears, sing, sing. Don't let the enemy silence your song. Let your story of God's grace in your life, what he's done for you, in you, and through you, let it become a song. It's not just something you narrate. It's something you celebrate. And proclaim. Let your story become your song. You know, this gospel that we believe in, this gospel that we proclaim is a story. The myth that became reality or the myth that became fact in the words of C.S. Lewis. It is a story. There's another words of a beautiful hymn. I will sing the wondrous story of the king who died for me. How he left his throne in glory for the cross at Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the king who died for me. This is the greatest story ever told. And the church has been singing it through the generations and through the ages. The story of salvation has become our salvation song. So would you read with me please? Uh, from one of the psalms that speaks of this, one of my favorite psalms, and the psalm that I was actually reading when, when Richard first uh, asked me to come and speak. It's Psalm 126. It's one of my favorites. I'm sure many of you will recognize it. I'm reading it from a slightly older version of the New International Version. Do you know you can get the old New International Version? Did you realize that? Uh, I'm reading that. I'm reading it from my dad's Bible. And, uh, oh gosh, I've left my glasses down there somewhere, so I'm hopefully going to read it from my old version. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, it's in my bag, I think, but I, I, might, I might be able to manage with that. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Thank you. Our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy. And it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the desert. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Songs of joy. I want to talk particularly about songs of joy and praise and celebration. I know the Bible teaches us that there is a place for songs of lament. Songs where we express our grief. And that's fine, but please, not all the time. Not songs of lament all the time. Otherwise, we begin to sound like Morrissey, wouldn't we? And nobody wants that. Uh, I'm sorry if I just lost all the Smiths fans here now. I'm, that's not singing, that's whining to music. But anyway, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, where was I? Yeah, songs of joy. Songs of joy. The singing distills and gives expression to the deep working of the soul, of God in our soul. Salvation songs strengthen the song. And it does something for us, but it's not just about what it does for us and in us. It can change the atmosphere around us. You know, I'm a, I'm a school teacher. I'm a part-time school teacher as well as leading the church. I, for the past seven years, I have, I have been a school teacher. And I know what some of you are thinking. You look like a teacher. I know some of you are thinking that, but... But I do things in teaching which are perhaps a little bit more unexpected. So I will frequently break into song in my lessons. Um, it's not, they're not music lessons either. <laughs> I'm a religious studies teacher. And I recently I've been teaching my students about Christianity. You know, it's religious studies. Um, I'm teaching them about Christianity. It's in the syllabus. So I'm teaching about the crucifixion. And they get a rendition of when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. We, I get to resurrection. And of course, what do they get? Thine be the glory, risen, conquering son. The other day, the other day, they got amazing, great sound. It's not, by the way, because I'm a good singer, but they're a captive audience. They can't, they can't get away. <laughs> Please, sir, can I go to the toilet? No, sit down and listen. No. <laughs> I'll put you in detention and come and sing at you. No, I won't. I'm, I'm only joking. They love it, really. It's just uh, making a fool of himself. But singing changes the atmosphere. I, I wanted to, we'll see how we go with this. I, I was traveling to, 
to Liverpool region. I, I often go to Liverpool. I, nobody's going to boo, are they? No. Okay, good. I often travel to Liverpool. Uh, I come from that kind of neck of the woods, so from the other side of the Mersey. But when I was trying to get, I noticed again, as you, if you go into Liverpool off the M62, it says Music City. Music City. And I imagine that some of you in Manchester would like to think, Liverpool don't have the monopoly on that. We're a musical city. And, 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 and it is, isn't it? Manchester. I mean, I think, who's the best? I don't know. We, Liverpool does have the Beatles. You know, and Jerry and the Pacemakers, you know. Scylla Black. Ken Dodd, you know. <laughs> Happiness. Happy. No, but... <laughs> And okay, Manchester have some good singers too. Good, so you've had some good bands. I reckon that. But I wonder if we as Christians could change the music of our city. We could change the mood music. We could shift the atmosphere. We could change the culture through the songs that we sing. Now, that doesn't mean just going out and singing songs and praise in the, in, in the, in the town center. Or the city center, sorry. Do that by all means. Great. But I want to talk about something a bit deeper, stronger, more permanent, more lasting. And that's what, about what we choose to do. And I did intend, we'll see how we go, to just to share three kind of categories of song with you. Three types of song with you that um, I think will help to change the mood music of our culture. And uh, I may only get the first one done. We'll see how we go. But the first one, I want to call it the Song of the Lord. The Song of the Lord. Um, and you'll see why. But in Psalm 126, which we read, that's where the exiles were coming back. They've been set free. They've been delivered from exile. And of course they're singing. Of course they're singing. They've been set free. He led the captives back to Zion. But in Psalm 137, and how many of you know 137 comes after 126? I'm full of profound insights like that, you know. Just, 137 comes after 126, but there they're, they're still captive. There they're still in exile, and they say, we, 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 were, we, we, were, um, we sat down and wept, yeah? Uh, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept. I just had to remember Boney M then for a minute. But we, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept. They said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? How can we sing the Lord's song? In a strange land. They hung up their harps on the trees so because they said we couldn't sing. But you know what? That's exactly when you need to sing. It's in the hard place. It's in the strange land that you most need to sing. Singing needs, it does not just accompany salvation. It anticipates salvation. It draws it in. And I know you, you, we, we look back and we thank God for all that he's done for us. All my life you have been faithful. All my life, you've been so, so good, and he's, he's saved us, he's forgiven us, he's healed us, he's done so many good works in our lives, but how many of you know you still need the saving work of God in your lives? Amen. Yeah, you're still waiting for that breakthrough, that healing, that provision, that, that transformation. Amen. We still need it, but we can anticipate that through swam my strength and my song, you become my salvation. Amen. Think of Paul and Silas singing in the prison. Uh, just singing hymns to God. What happens? It precipitates an earthquake and the, the, the prison doors are blown open. The chains are broken because they were singing praises to God. Singing doesn't just accompany salvation. It anticipates salvation. You need to sing in the hard place. You know, I talk about my students in my class. I, when I'm teaching them about Christianity, I have to teach them about different types of Christian worship. I teach them right through I teach them right through from uh, the, uh, the plain song in the monasteries of the Middle Ages. Right through, to, and they, you know, let me say, were you around then, sir? No. <laughs> That's them. Uh, but uh, right up to modern Christian music. But every year without fail, I've done this for about seven years now, every year without fail, there's always a type of music that they prefer above all the rest. And I'm sorry it's not Bethel. Okay. The music that always resonates with them that they love is gospel music. I play gospel choirs to them, and they absolutely love it. And when you think about it, gospel choirs, the one of the area of, of, of spiritual songs that has broken through into the mainstream. Everybody loves a gospel choir, and they absolutely love it. 
What's interesting is one of the roots of gospel music, and I, I'm not claiming to be an expert. I, I did a little bit of research via Google. <laughs> That's my academic work now. <laughs> but um, uh, one of the roots of gospel music are the spiritual songs or spirituals that the African slaves on the plantations and the cotton fields of America used to sing. They were the songs of hope that they sang in a, in a literally a strange land, in unimaginable hardship and awful oppression. Yet they sang the song of the Lord in that strange land, in that hard place. And I, I don't know if you realize it, but that music went on to influence and change music dramatically. You think of jazz and blues and even into rock and roll, and not all of it was good, but they shifted something in the music of our day that still continues today. And it was because of people who had faith in God chose to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. This Lord's song is a song of grace all around us. There was a poet at the end of the 19th century called Walt Whitman. He wrote a famous poem called Song of Myself. And that's exactly what our culture sings. You know, the, uh, but, but, but um, Mark Sayers says, the, the soundtrack to our culture, the soundtrack to our culture is anxiety. And he says, anxiety comes from focusing on the self, being obsessed with self. It produces anxiety. And he says this, in a culture that is obsessed with self, we need a revelation of grace. The song of the Lord is a song of, the, a song of grace. When they, the, the, they, they, uh, they brought back the captives from, to Zion and, and the mouths were filled with laughter and the tongues were songs of joy, it wasn't said, oh, you're so special. The nations didn't say, you must be worth it. No, they said, the Lord has done great things for you. And we agree, yeah, the Lord has done great things for us. It's not about me. It's all about what the Lord has done. The Lord's song is a song of grace. Can I encourage you, if, if you get nothing else this morning, get a revelation of his grace and sing of the Lord. You know, that there are, there are um, two main songs. Well, it, this was true a few years ago. But it's probably changed now. It's probably it's probably a Taylor Swift song now. But um, it used to be at funerals. The two main songs that were sang. One was "Amazing Grace." I did it my way. You see, one was "Self." I did. It. The other is "Grace." "Amazing Grace," by the way, the song written by John Newton. There was a man whose story became his song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It was great fear and grace that fear relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed. His story became his song. And it has gone around the world. It is one of the best known songs ever. This song of the Lord. This song about the grace of God. I was with my Mother recently, she lives, uh, she, she lives in a care with some other residents, and we were watching a, uh, a, um, a music concert on the, on the television, an Andre Rue, I think you pronounce it, uh, concert. And it was in somewhere like in Kuwait or Saudi Arabia, somewhere in the Middle East. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, these people came in as part of the concert. These men came in, all in Arab dress, but they were playing bagpipes. I mean, talk about cognitive dissonance there. You know, what? what? You know, <laughs> no, it's like the, the Germans developed a sense of humor or something. It was like uh, Arab people. Sorry, there's no German people here, are there? You know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it just got, what? It's kind of confusing. Arab people playing bagpipes. What were they playing? Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. You think this, this song, the man's story, which became a song and has gone around the world. It's all about the grace of God. And if some of you think, you know, if any of us, any of us at any time begin to get a little bit impressed with ourselves, 
And I think, well, I have worked hard. Paul said, I worked harder than everybody. Yet not I, but the grace of God within me. And the grace of God towards me has not been without effect. But I am what I am by the grace of God. The more, the more I, uh, I kind of move on as, uh, in my life as a Christian. And I've, you know, it's been a rocky road at times. It's been a, it's been a up and down road at times. Uh, like a, uh, well, I won't go too, too much into it. But all I know is it's all because of his grace. Again, I look back and I say, Lord, your grace is amazing. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so, so good. It is his grace. And anything that we have comes from him. Paul says, what have you got that you did not receive? Every good gift comes from the Father. So I want to encourage you. Sing the song of the Lord in the strange land, in the hard place. The, the problem with the song of myself is it will never sustain you through the hard place. Only the song of the Lord, only the song about the grace of God will sustain you in the hard land. Can I encourage you, when we sing the songs of the Lord, because we sing the songs of the Lord, it's about what he's done. And I love the response of the psalm. The nations say, the Lord has done great things for you. And then they say, yeah, yeah the, the, God has done great things for us. It is the Lord. Um, I'm not just talking about singing. I'm going to just do the one, by the way. You'll be relieved to hear. You're thinking, Trevor, you've got two more to go, you know. I'll just tell you what they were and keep you, you know, guessing about what I might have said. <laughs> but one was the song of the well. Do you know you've got a well within you of the Spirit? And if you look at Numbers 21, it says, spring up, oh well. Sing about it. Instead of waiting for God to do something, sometimes we need just to say to ourselves, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him. Singing releases the Spirit within you. So learn the song of the well. And the other one was the song of the Lamb. And I'll just leave you guessing on that one. But uh, I want to encourage you. I'm little songs. Do that. On my way over the Pennines this morning, on my way here, I, I perhaps should have been going through my notes but, uh, mentally, but I didn't. I, I just sang songs. I will sing the wonder story. <laughs> I just kept on singing on the way over here. But I'm not, and I do encourage you to do that. I have made it part of my clip. I know we're all learning about the discipline of silence and solitude, and they're good things. But don't forget the discipline of singing. Make it a practice singing. Even when you don't feel like it, I will sing to the Lord with all my heart. But I'm not just talking about literally singing the songs. I'm talking about what is the soundtrack of your life? What is the playlist of your life? Because that's what you'll take into your world around you. And if it's the song of grace, if it's the song of the well, if it's the song of the lamb, which is about humility, by the way, if it's the song of the lamb, you will shift and change the culture around you. Let me finish by praying for you. I, well, you can, you can imagine what I want us to do next, can't you? I think, yeah, yeah, you got it. You got it. Well done. But let me pray for you first. And my prayer is this. Lord, that for everyone gathered here, that our story would become our song. That the story of your grace in our lives will become our strength and our song. That it will be the song, not of the self, but of the Lord. A song of amazing grace, because only that will sustain us. I pray that we will learn the song of the well. That the mood music that we bring into our world will be one of the spirit of life and peace. And I'll pray that we sing the song of the Lamb. A song of the one who overcame, not by coercive power, but by sacrificial love. A song of the king who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. It will be a song of quiet humility and faithful service. And it will change the world around us. Amen.